QSO Today, episode 185, Mitch Gill, NA7US. The QSO Today podcast is sponsored in part by QRP Labs, maker of the most state-of-the-art but easily buildable kits for ham radio today, and by all of you listener sponsors who make regular donations and financial support of the QSO Today podcast. Options for being a QSO Today supporter are in the menu items at the top of the QSO Today homepage. Please become a listener sponsor today. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. My guest today is the new editor of the QRP Quarterly Magazine, the official journal of the QRP Amateur Radio Club International, and a former columnist for both Popular Communications and CQVHF. Mitch Gill, NA7US, has a love for all things amateur radio and is now retired from active military service where he operated as YI9TU in Iraq. Mitch tells this story and much more in this QSO today. NA7US, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Mitch? 4Z1UG, this is NA7US. I am Eric. Mitch, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Oh, it was in the 1960s. I was uh, probably about 12 or 13, and I got a shortwave radio and just became fascinated with it. And uh, I strung antennas up all over the place just to sit there and receive the world. And I met uh, a young man who was my age, and he was uh, getting his license, or he had gotten his license, actually, and uh, brought me over and let me listen to the dits and dots (laughs) that were on uh, his radio and then talk to me all about it and what you could do with it. And I just became fascinated with it. So from there, I went and got my license. And what was the shortwave radio, and what kind of radio did you have? It was an old realistic, uh, an old Radio Shack one. I don't know the model number anymore. General coverage. Say it again? It was a general coverage receiver. If you if you whack the, whack the knob, you'd go 100 KC. Yeah, I actually had to put a vernier dial on it, so that way I could sit there and listen to the ham bands, because otherwise you'd run right through them. How old were you when you got your first license? Uh, 14, 1969. I was... Uh, WN4TUT and Grant, whose uh, call sign now is WB4SWH, uh, was my Elmer at that time. Uh, WN4TUT. Now, where were you? What was, what was the hometown? The hometown was Miami Lakes, Florida. It's uh, the suburb of Miami. What was your first rig? The first rig was that realistic uh, receiver, but then I got a, a Heathkit DX40 uh, for the transmitter. So you were a novice at that time? And, yep, uh, no, was, and the DX40, was that, did that imply 40 meters? No. Um, DX40 was just the model number for a Heathkit. Um, and it was strictly CW, crystal controlled. Um, I think it was 15, 40, and 80, but I only had a 15 meter antenna. So that's what I use for, uh, gosh. I don't know, quite a while <laughs> as a novice until I upgraded uh, my rig. And what did you upgrade to when you when you finally uh, did HW, upgrade? An HW16, the one that I sold to Glenn Popeil. Oh, is that right? Yep. Yeah, that was my novice rig. I keep asking for him back, but he won't give it to <laughs> me. No, I'd love to have that rig again just for the nostalgia purpose. It was a great radio for its time. I mean, it was very sensitive and... I had a blast operating with it. Did you get the companion VFO later? No. No. Actually, Grant uh, had built a uh, crystal VFO. I call it a crystal VFO. What it was was a, a switch that could go uh, like 24 different places, and each one had a socket with the crystal in it. He was a genius. And since I only operated on 15 meters, it was perfect. Do you remember your first novice contact? <laughs> my first novice contact yeah let me give you a little bit of background on that is that i got my license uh in the winter of 1969 my parents came and picked me up and gave it to me and i was so excited and i went back and immediately i already had my rig set up in the garage so understand i was cold um and I sat there and started transmitting, at, and this is in the evening. I'm 15 meters in the winter, and you know what that means. It's dead. There's nobody there. So I start transmitting a CQ, 
And all of a sudden, I got a call back from JD1 RPS, Juliet Delta 1, Romeo Papa Sierra, Manami Torishima Island. Back then, that was a very rare DX. And I had a conversation with him. I can't remember his name. Oh, for probably a good hour. So immediately after finishing that, oh, I dragged my parents in to hear all these dots and dashes going on. <laughs> immediately afterwards, I called Grant because I was going to brag. I'm 14 years old and I'm on ham radio and I got a real rare station. Well, come to find out it was him. <laughs> he lived two blocks away from me and he was transmitting. Back then for a dummy lobe, we used light bulbs. Right. And he was using a light bulb and he was transmitting that. So what ended up is that Another friend, WB4TTZ, who was a novice back then, and I sat there and told Grant after he admitted it, and I was so mad, and we told him that we had recorded it and we're going to send it to the FCC. And we hung that over his head for about a month. And then finally, uh, Mike, uh, WB4TTZ, gave him, gave him the uh, reel that didn't have anything on it and Grant sat there and rolled that out <laughs> along all at the school and then picked up all of the scrap from the tape and everything else and threw it away. But that was fun. Well, that's amazing. You mentioned uh, Glenn Popiel, who is now KW5GP, and he was my guest in episode 49 of the QSO Today podcast, who is famous for his Ar Arduino ham radio project books. He says that you were his ham Elmer in your teenage years. Yep, yep. Uh, me, um, me. <laughs> Grant WB4SWH and I both uh, helped Glenn to get his license. And was he the younger kid on the block? He didn't actually live on the block. He lived. Uh, I can't remember exactly where he lived, but it wasn't real close. We got together, I think, in school. So that way, uh, afterwards, then we went over to his house, and then he would come over to ours, and then we would sit there and help study and practice uh, Morse code. Until he finally got the license. That's how I helped him out. In those days, were there a lot of hams your age in, in the high school or in the schools? Yes, there were a lot of them. I remember going to my first uh, ham convention down in Miami, and uh, there was a lot of young people. I'd say probably about 30% of the all the hams in there were, were young hams that were in there probably below 21 and anyone above 10 years old. And what do you think is different from those times to these times? Technology. You know, kids kids grew up now with cell phones, you know, and, and Internet, and they can talk around the world. They don't need a radio to do that. Right, so they don't recognize the, the magic. Yeah, they're not as interested in it. Uh, you know, my son's a classic example. It's a technician before he ever had a cell phone. Uh, he was on the radio all the time, and he was well-known in the, in the area because he's a comedian. But after I got back from Iraq, I, I got him to get his general license because I wanted to make sure at least he had something in case of an emergency because he still has two meter radios. He just doesn't use them. And, uh, you know, I have an HF station that he's w welcome to use anytime, but it's just not something that interests him anymore. And I think that's a lot of young people. And it's some, I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have in ham radio. Do you have a solution for that? Um. You know, I, 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 yeah, to me, if we would sit there and emphasize it in school, you know, make a class on, on amateur radio, because it gets them into electronics, it gets into communications, so many different areas, satellites, so many different things that they could do um, if you get them at least started. But they've got to get a general license. Technician license right now over here in the States, uh, a lot of people, I mean, the, it's on the rise. Well, the reason it's on the rise is because people are using it for emergency communications. Uh, the Mormon church is well known for, they they have instructors teaching their different groups about ham radio, and they get on the net once a week, but that's all they do. They don't chat on the radio, or at least the ones that I know didn't chat on the radio. So, uh, yeah, education to me. If we could sit there and get it, get them young while they're in school, get them excited about it. Does a technician class license in America, does it have the novice privileges in 80, 40, and 15? I, I know. It has uh, two, two meters on up, and then I think it also has 10 meters that they can do. But, you know, 10 meters has been 
dead for quite a while and be mostly dead because of the sunspot cycle we're in. Right. So if you're a if you're a technician class, then you don't have even have the ability to do CW only in the in eighty and forty that are open in the evening. Yeah, I don't remember about the technician if they have that capability. They might. Um, I just don't know. I've never really looked at it. But if it's CW again, if, with the computers of today, they could do CW, but. You know, I don't know what what kind of interest they would have. And I mean, for me, I've got to have my hand on a key. I don't want to do the computer when it comes to CW. Now, I do digital, but I just don't uh, do CW on digital. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? That's a good question. Um, Yes and no. The reason I say that is because uh, I never built anything. Never homebrewed anything because I'm a very badly colorblind. So back then, you know, you had to be able to read a resistor, and I couldn't read any of them, so I had no interest in it. I went to an electronics course I took, that, and that's before I knew I was colorblind, and, and flunked it and didn't like it. So I got away from, from the electronics side of it. Now, when I said yes and no, yes in the sense that after I got out of uh, high school, I went to college for two years, and then I joined the uh, Air Force. <clears throat> Excuse me. I joined the U.S. Air Force, and I went into communications. I was a, a radio operator for the U.S. for the Air Force from 1976 to 1989, and then I got out of the Air Force. Then I stayed in high tech for 17 years. Um, and then I got back into the uh, communications area when I joined the Army National Guard. I so, see. yes, it has had an effect on my life. But it's my understanding that you took a break from ham radio. And what was the circumstance around the break, and how did you get back in? Well, again, I, I could not read um resistors, et cetera. So the electronic side just didn't interest me. Well, the, the general license back then for me was just too tough. So I flunked it. I tried it once. Code was no problem. I was doing 45 words per minute by the time I was finished with my novice license, and it was a five-year non-renewable license. So when a license uh, let out or when it went away, um, I just stayed away from it. I mean, I didn't try to go back for a general until I got into the Air Force, and I was sent to Germany, and I met my second Elmer, which is W3IK, John Kosmak, who's now a silent key. And he got me back into it, because I was doing, I was a Mars operator over there as well as uh, operating as a backup to the primary alerting system in the Airborne Command Post. And John helped me to get right to the general. And I never touched a code key, and that was, let's see... Five, six years later, and never touched a code key and went and passed the general t- code test without a problem. It's like riding a bicycle. Um, wasn't as fast as I used to be, but that was okay. I passed. And that's how I got back into it with John. What was John's secret sauce, do you think, that helped you get over that hurdle and get you into the general class? He was just a very, very confident in his teaching ability. And actually, he became a professor later in life. He was an excellent teacher. He took his time with me. He explained everything to me, walked me through it, and kept on and on. I mean, we worked together on a daily basis. So whenever we weren't sitting there operating the radios, we were sitting there going into the book. So that was his his thing was that he was just, he's a natural born teacher. And did you have a station on the air then in Germany? Yeah, actually I had a uh, call sign was Delta Alpha 2 Golf Lima. My ham call sign, though, because we were APO New York address, was November 2 Bravo Papa Delta, which I could not stand. It's just a weird call sign for me. So anyway, I I got DA2 GL, and I worked over there for a couple of years. Um, I was the Mars director, so I had KWM2A and a 30L1 linear, and I went at it whenever I had time was off and Mars stations closed. I was sitting there operating on on whatever band was open. 
And this was the 70s, so um, Mars yeah. was quite helpful from Germany, connecting uh, servicemen in Germany uh, back to the United States then. Yeah, I was in Germany from 78 to 83, and yes, it was uh, Mars was a very important part of uh, um, communications back to the States because it was a free phone call. You know, the hams back in the States, they didn't even care. They would do long-distance calls, and back then, as you know, that wasn't really cheap thing to do. So I could call New York, and New York would call my family in Florida, and I could have a 15, 20-minute conversation with them. As I recall, in those days, it, it was a couple of dollars a minute, which was higher than the minimum wage per hour. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. expensive. Yeah. It's my understanding that you joined the Army National Guard, and that led to your deployment in the Middle East. Uh, what happened there, and where did you go? In 2004, well, actually 2003, I started looking to try to get back in the military after 9-11 happened. I had thought about it and thought about it. And I kept trying to, but they kept telling me I was too old. And finally, this Army National Guard uh, recruiter said I wasn't too old. And I went, really? Like that. So we started gathering up all the paperwork, which took uh, a couple of months. And by the time I got all the paperwork in and everything was ready to go, he said, I got to tell you, you're one day too old. And I looked at him and he says, but if you want me to, I'll get an officer to backdate it to yesterday. I said, do it. <laughs> so I rejoined 2004. And I was working in the uh, Joint Operations Center at Camp Murray uh, in emergency communications. And uh, 2006, I was deployed. I was a volunteer, actually. I volunteered to go to Iraq because pretty much if you didn't go to Iraq from the National Guard and your unit had gone, which mine had before I ever joined them, um, then you were pretty pretty low on the list. <laughs> and I decided that... Uh, you know, some young kid may not have to go to Iraq if I go. So I volunteered and joined up with the North Carolina Guard and immediately started working uh, on getting my license for uh, Iraq. Your ham radio license for Iraq. Correct. My ham radio license. Okay. Yep. And, and in wartime in the theater, um, how hard was that? Well, I had a lot of support from the, the uh, first sergeant, um, and the commander, they had no problem with me doing it because you got to remember that we were on a, on a base there. It was a contingency operating base spiker. And, uh, we had the, our own housing units, which just fit two of us. And then we had, well, what do they call it? HESCOs, which are basically sand filled around your buildings. So that way, if a mortar comes in, then hopefully it's going to hit that and not hit you. On top of that, I replaced a pole. I got a bunch of tent poles that I found. I say found. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I used that for a mast, and I put up a, a, a dipole, I mean a horizontal. Uh, an inverted V. Thank you. Yeah, I put up an inverted V. And uh, and I was then I, before that, I had to try to get my license. I found out how to do it through the Iraqi government. And it was a long process. Um, I was had that radio sitting there ready to go at Spiker for, oh, I'd say a good three months and never got the license. I finally got the license just as I was being, I, I could have gone back with the North Carolina Guard to the States, but I elected to stay in Iraq and I moved over to the Minnesota Guard who were down south um, at Talil Air Base or uh, Camp Adder. And uh, there I was able to put up the antenna. I didn't ask permission. I just did it. At that time, I had a slinky antenna. So basically, a friend of mine had made a slinky antenna, and I was working 20 and 30 meter CW on that. And it was a blast. And I had an ICOM 706, and I had also an FT817, uh, both of which got ruined <laughs> it, you know, from the sand over there. Okay, and, and so one of these radios, the IC-706, that's 100 watts. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then the 8, 817 is, is our standard QRP multiband radio. Correct. So I operated both. And uh, I found out that QRP was fine. The only problem was the propagation at that time was only up into the north, into Russia and Europe, uh, most parts of Europe. I think I only got one stateside contact out of 3,000 contacts I made and one Central America contact. Were there other American hams in Iraq? Yeah, there was a few of us. Um, 
not that many. Um, I'm going to say there was probably about seven or eight of us that were probably active over there. And the reason we could be active, because if, if we, you know, during your time that you worked, you usually work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Some days they gave us off. So <laughs> some days um, we would sit there and, and I would go back to the combat housing unit. That's what we call it, this chew um, to sleep. And instead of sleeping, I'd stay up and play on the radio because my roommate was working night shifts that night. So I got to work for a couple of months on the radio when I was not sitting there uh, guarding Iraqis or guard a uh, guard gate or uh, um, going outside the wire. So I got a lot of work in there. What advice would you give to amateur radio operators who are servicemen deployed overseas in terms of how to become operational? Well, first, don't ever operate when you have a rocket attack coming in. Second is uh, usually there's somebody there. Either it is uh, uh, an American officer or somebody who's got a contact with the government uh, for you to be able to get the license. But also, you know, Iraq, I don't even know if they allow it right now. Uh, The only reason I wasn't operating all the way through the deployment was because the Iraqi government decided that ham radios were just as dangerous as cell phones and uh, setting up for IEDs. So they canceled all, all of the uh, licenses, including their own country license. But I would say that's the best advice I could give is, is to try to get a government contact um, and then uh, try direct contact with them. If you can't do that, then you go through the military, you're through your chain of command uh, to see if you can find somebody who knows how to do it. I just got lucky. Did you have any contact with Iraqi hams? Yes. Oh, yeah. The Iraqi, uh, the person who was the one who could go to the government was actually an Iraqi. And I had discussions with him uh, a couple of times, but I did not ever uh, meet any of the Iraqi operators themselves. Right. So they didn't have like an active ham radio club or, I mean, we're talking post Gulf War here, right? No, we're talking the uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And no, <clears throat> you got to remember that I- I'm sitting at a base near on Nazaria and the ham radios area that was big there is in Baghdad. And I will, even if I was stationed in Baghdad, for me to go outside the wire to go visit the, the those people would take a lot of permissions. And if it wasn't uh, relative to what we were doing over there at that time, there's no way that I would be able to do it anyway. You know, you're in the middle of a war zone. They're not going to sit there and just say, oh, you can go visit a ham radio club. When did your tour of service end? Uh, March of 2007, I was evacuated out of Iraq and sent to Germany. Well, no, I was first sent to Baghdad, to the uh, hospital in Baghdad, then to Germany, and then back to the States at Fort Bliss, Texas. And that was the end of your military career? No, I stayed in the National Guard. I was not wounded or anything in Iraq. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was not wounded in Iraq. Um, I all of a sudden was having uh, uh, trouble breathing, and I was having also uh, uh, felt like a, a heart attack or something coming on. They thought I was having a heart attack, but it came to find out it was not. It was uh, it was from the uh, burn pits, in my opinion, over there that just screwed up my lungs. And I couldn't breathe. So got sent back to the States and stayed with the National Guard until I retired in 2014 and got my 20 years here. So you're recently retired. I am recently retired, totally retired. I'm I'm almost envious. (laughs) Um, I have, I love being retired. (laughs) It's my understanding that you still own a Drake TR4C, which is a an old Drake transceiver, which I think is probably circa about the time that you got your first license. Yeah, it was one of those rigs that um, I really, really uh, envied uh, anyone who had one. They're, they're a beautiful radio. Their sound is great. They're, they're sensitive. And for me, it was just, uh, I only bought it recently, about a year ago. Um, and it's just a flashback for me. I own an HW8. Uh, it doesn't work. I haven't really worked on it, um, but it's really for display. It's just to remind me of my days as a novice. 
I'd like to find that HW16, Glenn, if you're listening to this. Although I do see them on eBay from time to time, the HW16. Yeah, I do too. Um, but, you know, it's it's a matter of the quality of who built it and everything else. And I don't know. I just haven't gone that far yet. I think you have to be prepared to tear the thing down and rebuild it if if you haven't. I don't have that expertise, and I don't uh, I don't like bothering people to do that. You know, friends that I have that are in, in radio, I don't like to just hand them a radio and say, would you tear this apart and clean this up for me? Well, the, you said the HW8's on the shelf, but do you operate the TR4C? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love uh, – see, I, I like the – the TR4C I like for the HF nets for single sideband. I don't do single sideband QRP. I just do CW QRP. So for anything that I want to do voice-wise, um, then I use the T uh, the TR4C or I use my uh, FT1000. I have too many radios. Since QRP is not a religion, um, it's okay to own a, a TR4C and an FT1000 and also be a QRP operator. Yeah, but I like I said, I have too many radios. I have a K1, I have a K2, I have an X108G, 1018G. Um, the 817, I still have another 817 now. And then the other two rigs, I forget what else I have. Well, I think um, whether you have too many radios is really a, a matter of opinion. Well, I have one antenna, <laughs> one for HF at least. So I have an, a, a switch, so I've got to go between them. But it's fun. The different sound, the way that, you know, one radio does one thing great. One radio does another thing great. You know, the FT-1000 is great on uh, digital digital modes like JT-63. And uh, the TR-4C is strictly single side band. That's all I use it for. And the FT-817 is a great uh, either QRP rig for the f field or an IF rig for if you're working microwave or something like that. So it has a lot of interesting uses. Yeah, I use the the FT817 is my my one for my go bag. So I have a bag that I have in the car that's got you know, it's got a compass in it, it's got some food in it, it's got water in it and last and knife it's got in it. And then I have my 817 and I have a uh 40 meter antenna that I can put on the back of the car and I've got a 2 meter. And so I've got the if there's an emergency like an earthquake I can at least communicate. And that's the reason I wanted my son. I tried to get my wife to get a license. That didn't work. But that's the reason my son, I told him adamantly, he's got to at least have a two-meter radio because then we'd have some communication between the two of us, hopefully. You said in an article for the K7 LED Relay newsletter, that's for the Mike and Key Amateur Radio Club in Seattle, Washington, that QRP gives you the same feeling as when you were a novice. Can you describe that feeling? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a thrilling feel. You know, the feel feeling of a thrill. When I was a novice, you know, just working a new country, even though I was running what seventy five watts, uh, working a new country, getting a QSL card from them was just the biggest kick I could get. Well, you know, you kind of I wouldn't say lose it. it well, maybe you do. Uh, <laughs> But it, the feeling becomes different as you get older and you've been in the ham radio, you know, over 40 years. And you want to try something different and something new. And I've tried a lot of different modes uh, over the years. But QRP to me was the one, the first contact I made from here um, was back east. I think it was Georgia. And it was on one watt. And I thought, huh. If I could do this, this feels just like it did when I was a novice. It was just thrilling to be able to do that. Every time I got a country, it was just a new feeling again. So then I challenged myself to sit there and, and try to go uh, uh, 100 countries, which I have not done as of yet. Um, but that's the thrill that it gave to me, that gave me that feeling again, that there was an excitement, something that just, you know, normal people just don't do. Normal people in ham radio I shouldn't say normal. That's not the right word. But others in ham radio, you know, use 100 watts to 1,000 watts to make contacts. You know, there's, there's, then there's the group of us called the QRP, and then there's the QRPP, you know, that are running hundreds of milliwatts. And that's my next challenge. That's my next thrill. And it's a thrill to be able to sit there and say you've gone so many thousands of miles, you know, on something that's 
less than a light bulb would ever do. And now this message from QRP Labs. In the past episodes where we have advertised QRP Labs and the kits designed and marketed by my guest in episode 125, Hans Summers, G0UPL, we discussed his new QCX transceiver. However, in this episode, I want to remind you that if you want a QRSS slash WhisperNet transmitter and can easily be, that can easily be expanded to automatic multiband operation, then the Ultimate 3S is the kit for you. With upgrades, the Ultimate 3S can be expanded to six high-frequency bands, high stability using either a QCXO or a GPS receiver. Start small and build it as you master the Ultimate 3S's capability. For grins, I plan to use the Ultimate 3S in WhisperNet mode to run in the background while I'm creating episodes of the QSO Today podcast. Wouldn't that be a kick? So if you're looking for a great through-hole kit experience using the latest state-of-the-art technology, including Arduino microprocessors and the SI5351A synthesizer, then check out the latest kits at QRP Labs. To let hands know that you support the QSO Today podcast and heard about QRP Labs here, click on the QRP Labs logo on the show notes page for this episode or tell hands that you heard it here on QSO Today. QRP Labs is my choice for kit building. It should be yours too. And now back to Mitch Gill, NA7US. Do you operate the digital modes as well as CW? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, CW is my favorite. But yes, I do uh, right now JT63 and just starting to get into FTH, but I'm not, I don't care for FT8 that much. To me, it's almost like it's computer controlled. But I do like JT63 because there's a little bit of interaction that's in there. But I love CW because you have as much interaction as you want. Now, you sent me a picture of a bug, I think. It's made by Viz Key, Victor India Zulu Key. But it, it's, it has an unusual orientation, and I'll post it in the show notes, a picture of it uh, that you sent to me. It seemed unusual to me because it looked like it was vertical. Is that Was I seeing that right? You were seeing it correctly. It is a vertical vertical bug, and I love it dearly. It's it's very, it, it's got a touch to it that I really like, and really like it a lot. That's my favorite key. I have lots. that viz key. That that is a bug, right? So it has a uh, an arm that vibrates to make the dits. Yeah, if you look at it, you can see the arm goes straight up, and then there's a weight at the top of it. And so when you press the left key for your dits, it's going to move to the left and start vibrating. And then your dash is to the right. It operates the same way as as a, a lightning bug. But it gives your CW sending kind of a an accent. Well, I'm I'm a big believer that CW is a language. Uh, that's the way that's the way I've grown up with it. And that's the reason I think I didn't forget it in those years that I was not in the ham radio. Um I I feel like you can get nuances and uh, uh, on CW, and and I can sit there and hear somebody sending CW, and I can guess who that is. I know who that is if I've worked them before. Now, if you were teaching this language to someone else now, and you wanted them to also have the the personal sound, what would you recommend they do in order to get started? Well, the personal sound comes over time. Uh, you know, at the beginning, it's just a matter of sitting there teaching them. And I would teach them on a uh, hand key to start out with um, because they have more of a feel with that key. When you get up into a keyer, you know, then the feel is a little bit is totally different, actually. Um, but hand key to me is the biggest starter. Start them out, get them going and get them practicing. Keep practicing. Don't give up on it. Go out there and call CQ, and it doesn't matter if you're running five words per minute or 10 or whatever. Uh, people will answer. And just keep going. And as you keep going, that speed's going to increase. And your personality, the way you key, will come out. It just comes out naturally. And then the transition from the straight key is to, would you suggest a bug? No, um, a bug is... Uh, a, lot, a lot of guys out there and women don't like the bug, um, the sound of the bug. So I wouldn't recommend that. I'd recommend them going to a keyer. But if they want to try later on a bug, then that's fine because it's just it, a bug, like I said, has got a different sound to it. When I say sound, it's not really the right word, but it's the way you operate with it. Some people don't like the 
the uh, short dits and the long dashes because you're doing a dash manually with your thumb. So it has a it has its own cadence. Yeah, yeah, it does. It has whatever cadence you create in it. Now, do you use a keyer as well? Yes. And what do you use for a keyer? Um, you know, you had to ask that question. Well, I mean, is I it built two... into the rig, or do you actually use an external? No, I have I have two keyers. Um, they were both. Uh, I got them actually in Iraq. Had them sent over to me in Iraq. Um, they were homemade, um, and I can't remember what the name of the person who did it, but I got a small one and a larger one, um, and I like them very much, but I just can't remember who it was that made them. Will you send CQ automatically, you know, for a time in order to um, attract contact? I, I like to do a lot of listening, especially on the on the QRP frequencies. Do I send out CQs? Well, yeah, absolutely. When I want to sit there and just bring up a chat and do a little rag chewing. Um, but otherwise, I, I like to listen for the the ones that are on the QRP frequencies. And especially I like listening for the ones that are slow because I know that they are trying to build up their speed. Um, and I have no problem slowing down, you know, to sit there and operate them because to me it gives them the interest and it keeps them interested in in CW. And I think CW's you know, not for everyone, but for those that want to do it, I want to sit there and encourage it. Do you work DX? Do you work a pilot? Oh, yeah. I have done it before. Do you like to? I like being on the other end and right rack. I was DX. That was a blast. That was so much fun. Um, I had never been DX before. And just to sit there and have all these stations from all over the, the European area just clambering to talk to to get my call sign. And I had a uh, QS, QSO, uh, QSL manager, N2OO, and he was phenomenal. I've still got all the QSLs. I've got thousands of QSLs from all these countries. And some of the QSL cards are very unique. So N2OO would actually act as your North American QSL card bureau. Right, exactly. He was the bureau. And how did you let him know that you made a contact? I mean, he would send out your QSL cards for you, right? Yes, he did. He sent out and received them. Uh, I had a log that was uploaded to him, you know, anytime I wanted to. I did it practically every, well, at least once a week. So I would upload the log and then and people would sit there and be sending for contact uh, QSLs to make sure that they, they are in the log. And he would sit there and, and send out the cards and received them. Wow, that's quite a responsibility. Well, yeah, it sounds it, like you know a fair amount of work. And it didn't cost me anything. I got QSLs for free, uh, and they were phenomenal. And they got also uh, um, all that work that you put into it. But he's been doing this for years and years. He's he's most probably one of the most well known QSL managers out there. So I was very lucky to get him. Do you still collect QSL cards? No, not really. You know, I have probably several thousand QSL cards. Where am I going to put them? Uh, yeah, that's the new way it is today. You know, a lot of them aren't sending out QSL. Now, I have QSL cards that I would send out if somebody asked me for one. Uh, but there's a lot of hams out there that don't QSL at all. And, of course, you know, eQSL, you can sit there and just copy it right from the Internet, your contact, uh, and and put it on nice camera paper, and it looks just like a regular QSL card. So that's actually what... what uh, uh, Rudy does K seven R C V. I see. So he sends a an electronic QSL so people can print their own. Exactly. If they wanted, if they want a paper copy, otherwise they could create a um, an online QSL folder. Well, it actually, if you go to eqsl. Uh, dot cc, they have a folder already set up, so you confirm a contact. It'll go into the system, and you can create your own QSL card. And they can create their own their own QSL card, and you, I've got mine is from nine eleven. Uh, it's a picture of the twin towers, and I've never changed it. I think it's still the same. No, nope, no, nope, actually, I did change it to the memorial to the to the vets that uh, the soldiers that died in Iraq. So, you know, you can create anything that you want, and then you can sit there, and all you have to do is upload your files, your logs. Uh, to eqsl or um you can sit there and just acknowledge them one by one 
and that's like pretty much a new way people been doing it for years now. It's getting very, very, very popular instead of sending out QSL cards. So you upload your log, and then eQSL notifies the ham that he's got a QSL card. Yep, exactly. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Does that work with Logbook of the World? I mean, or do they sync together, or do you have to independently no, it's in, upload it's your logs? No, it's independent of it. Um, I have both. I have Logbook of the World as well. And I like Logbook of the World only from the standpoint that, you know, any I, – I'm one state away from working all states. I, I, I've never been the type ham that says, oh, I'm going to work all states. Um, it's been more like, yeah, I wonder how many states I can get today. But with Logbook of the World – it automatically keeps them going. So I just all of a sudden, you've worked all states. Wow, I didn't know I did that. You know, you worked all continents, or you have DXCC. And it's a lot easier to get today than it used to be when we were young. Today, it's, you know, like I said, with uh, JT65 and FT8, uh, where you can't even hear what's on there a lot of times, and you can still get a, get a contact. People are getting WAs, I mean, uh, worked all states and DXCC, you know, very, very fast. Yeah, I've heard from a number of the people that I've interviewed that um, the fastest way to get DXCC is to work a contest like CW, CQ Worldwide or something like that. That's correct, too. I, I, I agree with that. That's I know I've worked. Oh, gosh, I've, I've got to be over 200 countries now. And just in one contest, when when the solar you know, solar minimum is bad, but when the solar maximum, you know, I know that I worked probably eighty countries in in just a day one contest. But yeah, that's the best way. Contest and uh, the solar maximum would be helpful, but it, we got to wait a few years for that. Well, except we're at the solar minimum, and it's my understanding that that people are still making contacts. Oh yeah. At the solar minimum. Oh yeah, 100. do you do you agree with oh, that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there's times when the the it, it'll open up. Oh yeah, I've I've made contacts uh, into uh, Europe and I've made contacts into Asia uh, at the solar minimum. Um, so yeah, at 160 meters, I don't operate, but I have friends that do, and they they're just going hog wild over it. They love it. The solar minimum is perfect for them because of the the noise is so much less. Oh yeah, that would make sense. And then obviously the digital modes have kind of extended the ability for us to communicate around the world during the solar minimum. Yes, yes, absolutely. I was talking about from the, my perspective, operating CW, still there's openings or single sideband, there's openings. But yeah, on the digital modes, you don't need an opening. They're always there. Which means we're we're still propagating. Uh, we're still getting skip around the world. It's just, you know, there's a lot of absorption uh, at the same time. Yeah, you know, when you look at the reports that, that come out of JT65, you'll see minus 21. Well, that's dB below. You know, that's that's below the noise level. Uh, and your computer is pulling that out, uh, which, again, to me, is fascinating. Now, I ran across, when I was researching this episode, I ran across that you're a member of the North American QRP CW Club. And frankly, I don't think I've ever seen that club before. There's a great article about you when you were in Iraq in it. I'm just wondering, could you talk a little bit about what this club is and what its focus is? I belong to quite a few clubs. Uh, the North American QRP Club doesn't, it, well, it does exist, but it's not, not a club that actually, uh, uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it's not NAQCC, right? North America QRP Club, I believe, is out of Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, no, I think it's a. It's called the North American QRP CW Club. Oh, oh, okay. That particular club um, meets uh, every once in a while. They have contests that go on in which you could sit there and uh, connect with other club members uh, on CW and get points, and they get awards and everything for that. Um, I'm not really super active in that particular one. I I do go to do some of the contests, but it's not something that uh, it's, it's more like I like the idea that the more different things I'm involved with when it comes to old Miss for sideband or, or this club, when it comes to uh, CW, that means that uh, if I can give out numbers to people, you know, the the club number is, I mean, the, the member number usually is very important to them. Uh, it's like the SKCC. 
So I join all those. And when I get on, if somebody asks me for that, then I have that number available. I see. Do you belong to, and you, you say you belong to a large number of clubs. Is there an advantage to uh, belonging to a number of, uh, a large number of clubs? I know that you're a member of the uh, QRP ARCC club. Yeah, I don't know if it's an advantage um, for me, but it's an advantage for others. And I, I just like doing that. Um, if somebody wants my QRP ARCI number during a contest, then, you know, that's great. Um, or if it's SKCC, um, you know, any of those. And that's the only reason I really do it. It's not so much that, you know, it's, it's given me anything that I really want. But whenever I want to get on to like Old Miss on a single sideband net, then I can do that. Or any of the contests I want to enter, I can do that. Okay, so I, I understand now. So what you're saying is, is, is that each of these organizations has their activities. And, and if you're on the air and you hear that these, these activities are happening, you can use your ID number from that organization in order to give them a contact that they wouldn't have otherwise. That's absolutely correct. You got it perfectly. Well, I actually never thought about it that way before, but that's pretty cool. It's fun. You know, those contests are a lot of fun. Now, it's my understanding, because um, I saw this in an announcement of the QRP Quarterly Magazine, that you're the new editor of the QRP Quarterly Magazine as of, what, last November? Correct. And you're also a former columnist for both Popular Communications and CQ VHF. What in ham radio did you like to write about, and what brought you to the um, to become the editor of the QRP Quarterly? Well, if you look at... Uh, you said you were looking at the K7 LED relay. I don't know if you got my old call sign, uh, K7TUT. Right. Uh, okay. Now, if you notice, a lot of those articles are comedy. Um, I loved sitting there making fun of of my own inabilities to do certain things on ham radio and to, you know, let other people laugh about it. Um, the other thing is the serious side. The serious side to me was the... Pop the communications and CQVHF doing uh, emergency communications, writing on Homeland Security. And the reason I wrote on those is because I was involved with it, with the Army National Guard, being in the Joint Operations Center. And it was just something that became a passion with me. And then writing became a passion as more people enjoyed what I wrote. So when I wrote about the crazy rocket attack in Iraq and me getting, uh, what was it, VU-7, I think it's RG, uh, they they responded to that. That one was written in World Radio right after it happened. And then the thing about the QRP ARCI was that the, another Elmer of mine who got me into the QRP side is uh, K7SZ, who is also on the board with us on QRP ARCI. Rich Arlen, K7SZ, was my Elmer when it came to QRP. Anyway, Rich actually got me started in popular communications columnist. And from there, um, I'm not sure. I think I just was a member of QRP ARCI, and I saw where they needed an editor. And I just decided, okay, I'll apply for that. Since it's a nonprofit, there's no money involved. I thought, hey, this could be fun. So, And I enjoy it because I get to sit there and interact with all the other QRPers that are out there that are writing articles. And, uh, and I just sit there and clean up the writing if it needs to be add the pictures and send them on down to the publisher. So it was uh, just another extension of what I like to do in writing. Well, it's a great magazine. It's, it's really well presented. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to you. Well, that's Gary Breed, the publisher. He really can put that thing into, you know, he takes those articles and those pictures and rotates them around and puts them in the way that they should be put in. And he's done a phenomenal job. Now, you mentioned that you were involved in emergency communications, obviously as part of the Army National Guard. Are you involved in ARES or any of or MARS uh, on this side? Not now, I'm not. Uh, I was a member of MARS while I was in the National Guard. MARS kind of changed, and it just I just kind of grew away from it. But do I still do emergency communications? Not to the extent I did before. Uh, while in the Army National Guard, you know, I went down to Katrina right after the hurricane um, and was were operating emergency communications down there. And I also did uh, during the 
the last volcano eruption of Mount St. Helens, not the first one, but the second one, mm-hmm. or I should say the last one. And uh, and like I said, involved with Homeland Security. If there is something that happens, I automatically go on to the nets uh, and I automatically volunteer as a net control if they ever need that. Um, so that would be my side when it comes to emergency communications today. You know, being retired, um, we do a lot of traveling. So it's kind of hard to be a, a part of the group um, that you need to sit there and take that time to be able to sit there and go to the meetings and, and get certifications and everything else. Um, and I, I had that time period. And like I said, I'm now retired. So now it's more, so I'm going to sit back and relax. And if there's an emergency, I'm there. I'll help in any way I can. Now, do you find that in an emergency, CW is uh, an active language being used to convey information? If it's a local emergency, no. I see uh, that operating mostly on the VHF and UHF bands. Uh, The reason for that is, again, it's local. The last time we had an earthquake here, um, my son and I went out and got to drive a little bit of the area and we were able to sit there and identify areas that were closed. For instance, the river that we have near us actually went off course and they were worried about it flooding one of the highways. So I was able to sit there and tell people not to come down that particular road. Um, And we surveyed some of the buildings that were in the area. And, uh, you know, that's the type of emergency that I, I operate now. If it happens, that's what I'll do. Is the national traffic system still operational? Yes, they, they're up weekly on our uh, net, the K7 LEDs net, uh, 146.820, um, and asking for traffic if there's any traffic. You don't see a lot of traffic on the I haven't heard anything in a long, long time in the national traffic until uh, something does happen. Then when they get off that information, uh, they can use single sideband or they may use CW or they may use digital to sit there and, and trans, transmit the information. The national traffic system, do you think that it activated for um, like Puerto Rico or um, the hurricanes that went through Texas? Absolutely. And uh, when I was active in the uh, emergency communications side, you know, the, the Red Cross was a big part of it as well. So essentially you could take traffic on the two-meter repeater and then pass it to a, a national traffic system operator who could use a, make a CW message and send it across the to the next person, yep. you know, who can then take the message and then deliver it by telephone or by whatever, by, rad- by a voice. Yep, any way they can get it out, they will get it out. It's my understanding that they, they, you, you've mentioned that you're traveling now. Um, what do you travel in? And have you come up with a perfect combination of equipment and antennas that you can take on the road? I have a 34-foot uh, fifth wheel, my wife and I do. Um, and the radio, I usually take the, the K2. Uh, I already have it hooked into the uh, the 12-volt system that is uh, on board. Um, and then I have uh, an antenna that I ran down underneath the desk that I've got and outside and it goes to uh, a, what's called a super antenna. And basically, it is an antenna that slides up and down. It's vertical. It goes up and down. And then also, it's a screwdriver antenna as well. So it's like 40 through 6 meters. So when you land in your campsite, how long does it take to get on the air? Almost immediately, because I have it all with switches on the uh, by the desk. So I can immediately put the antenna. All I got to do is put the uh, whip on top of the uh, the screwdriver, which is just a matter of screwing it in, and I'm on my way. Oh, I see. So you actually climb the ladder up to the screwdriver, no, put no, the whip on. No, and... it's got actually it's got a slide itself that takes the antenna from the bottom of the stairs up to the top. It's a really neat system. It's like an elevator. Oh, oh, at the at the flip of a switch. Yep, flip of a switch. Oh, that's very cool. So you put the whip on the top of the screwdriver, slip the switch, and the thing goes up that's and, right. to the top of the... Yep. Oh, that's pretty amazing. And and do you find other ham radio operators in campgrounds as you're traveling? Well, yeah, that's how I met, met uh, Rudy, K7RCV, uh, who I'm elmering now. He was at uh, one of the campgrounds, saw my antenna, started talking to me, and he had gotten his general license, but he'd only been on two meters and had no idea what to do with HF. 
So over the last year, you know, last year, uh, I've been working with him, helping him, you know, get an antenna, build it, um, get a rig, uh, how to operate. We operated a contest so I could show him. He had never seen how far his radio could go. Well, his first contact was Australia uh, during the contest, and he was just thrilled. So so he's uh, he's about 75 years old, but he really enjoys it. He's just like a kid. And that, I get thrills out of that as well. That's why I've also taught um, homeschoolers uh, the amateur radio license as well. About fifteen or fifteen or twenty of them, I think I did years ago. Oh, that's cool. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Nothing negative. I don't. I had a, the only positive side of it uh, is again that we have some kind of emergency communications. Um, my son, when he was involved with it, that was a lot of fun. Um, my family, though, my wife was still uh, uh, deeply involved with the uh, amateur radio club that we belong to, K7LED. So it's, it's had nothing but a positive effect. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Um, you know, it's it's I, I, even though FT8, like I said, is more like a computer talking to each other, in my opinion, um, I still think technology is fascinating. You know what Glenn's doing? Um, and others that I've known that, you know, Grant and Mike, the, the two uh, I talked to about earlier, WN4, SWH at that time, and WN4, TTZ, um, they set up things like automatic radio teletype, where his teletype, which is the old manual ones, the radio would come on and, and it would automatically get the message to him and he could send a message back. And that was way before we ever had the, the ability to do it now. But I, I like the technology. I think the technology is fun. There's lots of things that you can do with it. You know, I like that the prices have come down in some technology. It allows you to sit there and uh, um, get an antenna analyzer, you know, for less than $200. Um, and it works well. Uh, so for me, I, I just, I love the technology. Yeah, I think we're always on the cutting edge, too. And that's uh, that's always a cool thing. Yeah, and QRP, like I said, just thrills me to death, especially the lower power I go. What advice would you give to new returning hams to the hobby? Um, I would say make sure that you get excited. Make sure you, you are ready to sit there and to not worry about what kind of antenna you have or what kind of uh, radio you have. Uh, just get on the air and start making contacts. Um, and that's what they had to teach me when I, when I had the PTSD. Well, I still do. But when I first was diagnosed with it, one of the things that I was having problems with was getting back into getting on the radio. So the thing was, they just said, just do it, continue to do it, continue to do it. And that's what got me back into it. It's the same thing for, for returning ones. Now, new hams, my advice for new hams would be is to get your general license as fast as you can. You know, the two meters is fine to start out with, but you want to be able to talk around the world. You don't want to just sit there and talk to your neighbors. And even though you could do it on uh, through the repeaters, you can go practically around the world now. Um or on the computer, I'd say still HF to me has got the most thrill. Right, right. The um, the repeaters that are linking over the internet, and I do it, so I'm I'm admitting it right up front. But I'm using a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure to talk ham radio. Yeah, and, but that's that's the thrill of it to me. Right, I think that's... A, a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure that's actually quite fragile. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, that's why ham radio is uh, good. That people are getting into it uh, for emergency communications because that's the one thing we found uh, during Katrina, especially was that when the system went down, it went down and you had nothing as a backup. The hams were there. Uh, they didn't let the hams into the area though, believe it or not, but eventually they set up emergency uh, towers. So cell phones would work in a lot of the emergencies out there. Ham radio is a part of it. Uh, if, if I lose all electricity and everything else, that's what's going to make a difference. That's what I did at the Joint Operations Center is I was in charge of, of all the communications for all of the armories in the state of Washington. So what I did was that I got them ham radios instead of these military-style radios that I really didn't care for. 
um, because they were so easy to hook up to 12 volts. So I had to teach them how to do that because they didn't know how to do that. I had to teach them how to talk on the radio because they didn't know how to do that. But I got them all ICOMs, uh, seven, eight teams. And then at our base station, we had an ICOM 7100. And I had two IC31s, which are the handhelds that for two meters that had GPS built into it so that if something happened like an earthquake, it could walk around the area and actually um, know where the person is that we're talking to in case that there was something that was happened, and like a lot of damage and everything. Yeah, do you have emergency power in your in your go bag? No, not in my go bag, but I do have it in my RV that whenever I take the RV, I have a solar setup that I use for emergencies um, and a controller. Um, so I do have that way. Actually, my son and I both have solar cells. And we have a, a multitude of batteries as well. But when it comes to the car, no, I'm, I'm going to be relying on it being something where I can still utilize the car, even if I can't go anywhere in it. Uh, at least I have that battery power. And if I can't move and I still have gas in it, I've got plenty of, plenty of juice to be able to sit there and operate for quite a while. Can we talk about uh, PTSD for just a minute? Sure. Do you mind? Not at all. Do you think ham radio is a potential therapy for PTSD? You know, I haven't thought about it that way. Um, that's a possibility. I, that might be something to explore. Uh, did it help me? Well, did it help me get back into ham radio? Um, that's interesting. I have not even thought of that, Eric. Well, I'm working um, a little bit now with, with someone who's interested in, in aging. You know, I guess we're all aging. And I've crossed over the 60 mark, and so therefore I'm aging. One of the things that um, that this person had talked to me about was is, is that people who have longevity in aging as they get older, it's because they continue to have people to communicate with, especially if they're uh, widowed. So they, they have some social outlet. They've got something that stimulates their brain beyond crossword puzzles, although those are very good. And there seems to be a, um, at least as if we're applying ham radio to aging, that there seems to be some therapeutic process that goes on, you know, by being active in ham radio. And I guess I'm I'm wondering whether or not that therapeutic benefit could actually be applied to PTSD. I don't know. Um I, I find it fascinating. I, uh, I agree with you on the aging process, you know, keeping the mind busy. And a ham radio can do that and um, allow you to communicate with others. So it definitely would work there. Um, but I don't know if P it kind of depends, I think. You know, PTSD is a, it really has different reactions to different people. I mean, there's an overall, you know, there's memory issues that sometimes come out of it. There's anger issues that come out of it. Um, but overall, it's it's kind of different for every person. Um, so I don't know. It's a good question. Might be something I'd like to explore. I, I think I might. By by the time that the listeners hear this, they'll know that I've already interviewed NW seven US Thomas, who's a very good friend of yours. I, it's a small world, but then again, I guess the ham radio world tends to be really small. Yeah, in a way it does. Uh, yeah, Thomas has got a strange spelling for his name. It's smelled like Tomas, but it's not. It's pronounced Thomas. Yeah, I, you know, the radio, um, I'm still in contact with Grant, um, Mike also, and Glenn, obviously. So the the friends that we meet on Ham Radio, even though we're separated, you know, I'm in Seattle, Washington. Grant's in Missouri. I think now he's in Florida. Mike's in uh, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina. K7SZ Rich is in the Atlanta area. So, you know, we all sit there and still communicate over the many, many years that we've been apart. Yeah, it's quite amazing. I, I think um, I still have ham radio friends from uh, childhood. And I, that's, I think, the power of the common interest. It is, it is a fascinating hobby. I mean, it really does, uh, like you said, I keep contact with people that I've known for over 40 years. And, and have not seen them in over 40 years. Uh, John Kosmak, the W3IK, what he helped me in Europe in the 80s, but I didn't sit there and see him until 2000 uh, for the first time in that, what, almost 20 years. 
Um, and it was just like we had just seen each other the day before. Yeah, I think that's the way it is. Mitch, thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. And with that, I want to wish you 73. It's been my pleasure, Eric. Thank you. You take care. Have a great day. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Mitch. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in NA7US in the search box at the top of the page. If you'd like to sponsor the transcription of this episode or any of the previous QSO Today episodes into written text, the cost is $67. US There's a button on the show notes page for this process. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. Finally, be sure to check out QRP Labs by clicking on QRP Labs logo at the top of the show notes pages for this episode. It will tell Hans, G0UPL, that you heard about QRP Labs on the QSO Today podcast. By supporting the QSO Today podcast, you offset my out-of-pocket expenses to record, produce, and host now over 185 episodes of QSO Today. I am extremely grateful for your support. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.